Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee or quarantinis and talking about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are John Schmidt and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 40, A Charming Fetish. We are welcoming Sandra Brenchley back to the coffee couch. And yay! Yay! Yay. Welcome. Thank you. I was hoping that we last time we discussed divination and prognostication and, and necromancy and other things ending with fancy sounding ANSI words. Let's talk about tokens today. Uh, I call it the ACT or the not Australian Capital Territory, but amulets, charms, and talismans, and other such fetishes because we see them. But I'm sometimes not convinced that people, when they're writing about them or using them in books, fantasy or whatever are using the right word for the right effect, if you know what I mean. I do know what you mean, yes. And quite honestly, when I started my research, and I tend to go back to uh, the fall of Rome, typically, for the start of my research, that ever since then, the names have kind of gotten used interchangeably at times. A little mingly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can understand that if you're not really specific on it, it could mean a lot of things. So I wanted to uh, back, what is it, see, it'd be, what, 75 or so uh, common era, scholar by the name of Pliny the Elder, if I'm correct. <gasps> Good old Pliny. We love Pliny. And that's the beer. Well, not we Pliny. like the scholar, too. We're the scholar. scholar. I was going to say Pliny the Younger. Okay, so Pliny the Elder. He... Uh, I always want to try to find the right word. It's never the right word, so I'm just going to make up a word. He uh, basically put them into their own uh, descriptions, and there are some mnemonics that go with it. Let's start with charms. If you've ever seen Lucky Charms, the cereal, it's about the same thing. Charms. Charms attract luck. So a four-leaf clover is a charm. Is a charm. Um, The Lucky Rabbit's Foot. That you'll sometimes see people wear. The the lucky shirt that people will wear at a ball game. Or Tiger Woods, who wears his red polo shirt always on the final day, final round of any kind of golf competition. That's his lucky shirt. Exactly. Something that attracts luck. Okay. Um, and specifically, it had to be uh, something that uh, was worn or... Uh, as jewelry or something, or something that you could wear on the body, just like in your pocket even, or in a pouch. The other one is amulet. So if you think A for amulet, A for away. An amulet was an item that could be worn that was meant to push away bad luck, push away anything that was bad. So like a St. Christopher's medal later, one would wear when one is traveling to keep away the bad luck that can happen on traveling. Kind of, yeah, kind of like that. My ability to pill, you know, kill any airplane I'm on then means because I've never actually worn a St. Christopher amulet, so clearly they work. Along, (laughs) and I actually have a St. Christopher's amulet, sorry, a St. Christopher's medallion that I keep in my car on the rearview mirror, and I'm an atheist, so, but I still believe in that thing. The but belief the, in God and belief in magic are different things. Moving on, they really are. They really are. Well, we are. That's a different yeah. <laughs> topic. But you brought up something though about the uh, Saint Christopher's medallion. It's also believed. I mean, if you want to break it down this way, a cross or crucifix, something that wards away bad luck or evil eye or bad spirits or that kind of thing or, or or danger. Those have sometimes been considered amulets. Because amulets can also be of a religious nature. Like the, if you go to Turkey, the concentric circles of dark blue, light blue, white, black are considered God's eyes. Yes. And they help you prevent against evil spirits coming at you. And they're everywhere all over Istanbul and they're beautiful. Yeah, but again, amulets, wonderful things. Uh, so we have charms, we have amulets, and the last one is called a talisman. A talisman specifically for attracting an attribute 
to yourself. So a talisman to, let's say, protect, make you uh, in, in, non-susceptible to bullets or protects you from a, a, the disease that's going through. Okay. Um, or a talis- talisman then could be when you wear this mask, you have uh, this monkey mask, you are as clever as monkey, or if you have... Along those lines, yeah. yeah. A talisman could take up so many things, uh, it, it, it shapes. It could be an actual physical piece of jewelry or clothing. The one I think is my favorite is, it's um, from Francis of Assisi. It's called the Chartala. Chartala. And, Chartala. And it's spelled exactly how it sounds, Chartala. And it is a piece of paper that Francis of Assisi wrote on one side, all of the beatifications of God. And on the other side was a couple of prayers, as well as a depiction of the cross on top of a mount of, and I'm not even going to try out, I will mispronounce the word, but it's on top of a mount. And it was folded up and tied. It was given to his best friend, a father who was also his clerk, and he told him, keep this on you at all times to protect you. And the man did. And he lived a long life. And then it was given over to the church. And the church keeps it as a reliquary. There's another whole avenue Ooh, right there. Ooh, reliquaries. <laughs> but it's actually inside its own glass frame now stuck up on a wall in one of the churches. It is now considered a reliquary. I, I thought a church was a little piece of paper, a little chart that was for a single dose of medicine. Well, and that's actually where it took its name from. This was something that was to keep long life, to protect him, to keep him healthy. Is, is this why you find medieval drawings of things under rock crystal? So you might have a symbol uh, uh, engraved on a, more put on a piece of paper under a piece of rock crystal. Or am I being... No, you're actually really close. That is... Um, if you're familiar with the scholar Agrippa, uh, which I am, yes, he had this. Okay, there's also something called the 15 Bohemian stars, Bohemian fixed stars. This was something very popular in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. There are 15 supposedly fixed stars in this in the sky. And we're talking like Sirius is a fixed star, um, Aegle is a fixed star, all these different ones, and they all had their own different properties. And so there were these talismans, again, talismans, because they had attributes. And on a piece of, a to- it didn't always have to be rock crystal, some sort of semi-precious or precious gemstone, the certain sigil of that star was carved on the back, and then it was set into jewelry, and you would wear it however. And some of these meant that you would be well-received by noblemen. Some would be saying that you were clever with your words and could get through by talking your way out of a problem. Other ones were very, like, you were good as a diplomat and it would protect you from thieves. So all these things. So, and these are coming from very well-scholared individuals. This is not something of the scared, uneducated masses or the peasantry. This is something that went all through every level of, of society. And it was, it was understood, it was thought, it was respected. Now, here's one of the big things that people will forget. A lot of these, and I'll go easily, 85% of all of the amulets, charms, and talismans you will see, especially talismans, were based out of a religion. So the Catholic Church had talismans. The Islamic faith has talismans. The Judaic faith has talismans. There was there was a great quote from the movie Luther. There are enough nails from the Holy Cross to shoe every horse in Saxony. Absolutely. <laughs> and and did you know how many bones Saint Christopher had? <laughs> Nearly two thousand. And you look here. I have the skull of John the Baptist. One as an adult. One as a child. Yes. So, <laughs> I wonder if the the logic sometimes there, but mm, still. Yeah. You know, but each of those things, you know, held in a reliquary was the what it is held in and then the object. But it, it strikes me how similar it is in its own way to uh, the Grigri from yes. West African origin. That yeah, was in, from Ghana. From, well, uh, they're more than just Ghana. But yeah, well, yes, more than just Ghana. But something and I, I honestly went in it 
when I first started looking at Grigri, I was thinking, of course, I'm looking at voodoo. I'm looking at New Orleans and the Cajun and the Haitians and all that. No, oh, got to no, go deeper. <laughs> much deeper. Actually, some of the earliest Grigris we find, yes, in, in the African area, are Islamic. They're actually quotes from the Quran. And they are folded up and they are carried in these cloth or leather pouches. And these were, again, supposed to be uh, very good and wholesome and protective. I really enjoyed, uh, from what I learned, um, believe it or not, we got a little bit of this when we were covering African music. Because mm. music and society and religion are all kind of you know bound up in one in many cultures and work songs. But a gris gris bag in parts of the, those parts of the world, you put your own toenail clippings and your own hair. And it's like the, the same way we talk about building, building a QP doll for, for, you know, Mardi Gras fun of, oh, and then I shall stick pins in it. You did it to yourself. You put, this is me when I'm healthy and happy, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put it in a little bag and have it here as a memory. And, you know, now we use Live Journal, but it's kind of a similar <laughs> idea of Facebook. Of, Facebook, you know, an object. MySpace. Of, <laughs> no, sorry. I never used MySpace. Okay. And of, of that you're carrying TikTok. around your own Cupid doll, your own TikTok of happy memories so that when you go back and you're having a super bad day, you can say, my goodness, look at all the happy stuff I've got because right here is my talisman of good. And with sage or with the herbs mm -hmm. that are, you know, purifying and clean and say, I'm going to maintain healthy. I'm going to maintain happy. I'm picking a particular orisa or one of the, the spirits to, or ancestry spirits or other spirits. There's a lot of different definitions that yeah, I've seen. absolutely. But this is mine in particular. Now, the only one that made me stop and, you know, lose my tea a little bit was the, and then women wore these as a method of birth control. And then that's, oh, well, it's at least as useful as the rhythm method, you Pretty know. Much, so. yeah. Well, and it wasn't written by male floor. scholars. What? Was that account written by male scholars because if they have a, a penny royal amulet you can bet that the interpretation may not be exactly what the scholars said i'm shocked thought. shocked i say can i ask a, a potential guiding question sure so now we know the difference between the three and we've expanded out a little um how common were these it obviously you said that all social classes have them but when i go out and look around everyone has a lucky charm mm-hmm uh, if I was, let's say, uh, it's 1670 and I'm surviving the plague and the fire in London, how lucky am I have to have one of these? People? Or how likely, wow, likely, luckily? You know, everyone had an attitude, but even the most staunch, unsuperstitious individual will always have something in the back of their rabbit brain that will say, Something is, um, I was wearing this shirt or I was wearing this medallion when I went through the fire and survived. Or I was, when I heard that, I mean, oh my gosh, let's look at World War II if we can actually, or World War I even. There are a number of individuals when armistice was announced or when the surrender was announced that they actually cut their hair and kept it into um, lockets as a thing of this was that sacred day. This was that very special day when the world changed. And so they would actually keep those with the family house. I wonder if it got watered down a little bit later with the way that people keep locks of their baby's hair. Maybe, and, yeah. You know, it's the, or the baby now it's shoes. just sentimental. The bronzing of the baby shoes. Yes. yes. Or the stuffing of the dead pets. <laughs> Yeah, oh, no, it's... Oh, trigger. <laughs> they, what's that elephant in the room? No, really, we can't get into the room anymore. Um, the one thing I noticed is if we want to get to the point of, of, say, looking at this from a writer's point of view, because I know that's what we are here for, you know, in a way, is I love, so much love the world building that you will find writers doing. And some of them will create their own religions and their own magics and their own philosophies and their own fears and attitudes towards things. My whole thing is that when you understand why charms and amulets and talismans happen, when you understand why they happen in a psychological way for a person, 
you will understand better how that works in a person's world building. And I, I, someone recently just said, it's like, know precisely what's going on. So you, I mean, know the rules so you can break them later, but at least you're understanding what you're breaking right? or bending or uh, altering. We had a little bit of that when we were discussing magic systems. So you've got to know it. Even if you don't have to explain it to people, you kind of have to know what it means. And so in it has always made me that teensy bit sad when somebody has built, oh, it's a fantasy world and we've got some gods and they've sort of done it in the, I'm just going to call it the easy D&D. Well, here's the sigil of my God and I'm a priest and I have it so that I can turn undead level three <laughs> instead of really getting into any of the, well, is it, do you have a charm? Do you have a medallion that's an amulet for protection? Do you have, how do they build all of these things in? Because even if you go out to like Merriam-Webster, they'll say, oh, it's a charm or an amulet or a thing or a spell. And all. they're just kind of, they lump it all together. And so I think it is neat when you can find the stories that come out that actually did take it apart. Mm-hmm. Like, like I, I didn't know about the Quran, but that is a fascinating parallel for me on the story of the golem. Yes. The, the, from Prague. Absolutely. From the Czech golem of the... One of my favorite folklore pieces. Oh, it's the best. And it's the story of basically how a man made a, a mannequin of, you know, full-size man of mud and pieces and then wrote a holy word and tucked it into the golem's mouth. And so the golem could then go forward and smash the enemies and, mm-hmm. you know, protect Prague from the raiding invaders. Exactly, Yes. And, and that, too, that makes it sort of the, the moving tamulet, the, the spell that had it all go, which was both protection for this and a and an effect externally. Yes, what was the purpose? And that's also, again, when you look at, I'm sticking here with the amulet, char, amulet charm talisman, is purpose. What is the intent? You'll see that with the Grigri. Let's look at that. The Grigri, once it... Um, it is said that when it came over to the Americas and um, it, during the colonialism and such, it got adapted into the local religion, the Haitian religion, voodoo, the Creole religions, or the Creole culture, I should say, not so much religion. And it got changed up again by some of the people's intent, where originally it was supposed to be a protective charm. It was supposed to be something that was uh, for the good purposes, and then it got used to harm other people. By a, And that was a whole thing of intent. So in me, if you're going to use any of this, especially in writing, what is the intent? What is, is it a focus? Is it just something that acts on its own? But along those lines. So it's... It's a fascinating, it's, this is to me one of the highlights of, of I, okay, if you're going to ask me any questions, it's, it's my favorite thing is understanding how a person thinks and how a person operates. Um, when I'm doing tarot card readings, again, let me put something out there. I'm a total non-believer in any of this. I really, really am. So when I do tarot reading for people, it's strictly as um, a way of counseling, Just getting them to already think what's in their head and open up about it. Same thing with amulets and charms. I can have you right now create your own charm or your own, uh, I should say your own amulet or even your own talisman. I can have you create something right now. Hashtag what's in your gree-gree bag. Okay, wait a second. All right, go. John, you're making a gree-gree bag for yourself. What goes in it? Depends on which one you're talking about. The motorcycle bag had a melted fuel um, filter to keep that away from me and amethyst to keep me un- drunk on the road so I wouldn't crash a, uh, and some memory things. And this was in a small bag tucked into the, uh, the motorcycling jacket. I really like how Sandra has, has delineated the difference between the things. But re- I also rode a, a bike that had on it uh, a Norse rune to – avert misfortune because the previous owner was strong that all right sandra what's what's in your greek 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 bag well right now (laughs) i actually put one together so i knew how to put one together um i have my wisdom teeth because i had my wisdom teeth removed and they weren't broken up so i have solid ones 
I have Dirt from Stonehenge because to me that is one of the favorite, most mystical and magical places I remember growing up. Um, I have a piece of silk in my favorite color of lapis blue. And then I have um, a piece of pyrite because a friend once told me that I had the quality of pyrite, which was to cause sparks. <laughs> Jeannie, what about you? Uh, I had a gree drawer, I suppose, when I was a kid, and it involved an empty thing of juicy fruit because I liked how the, the packet smelled and rocks and seashells that I'd collected. Absolutely. Because they brought back happy memories, but yes. that was it. And I'm I'm sorry, it kind of all disappeared from that. And I, I feel guilty that I don't have one. Not my my Grigory bag is full of kind bars and leftover jerky now. So. Well, you've got a plague bouquet that I just sent you. So Excellent. So we'll have that. There was also, you, you started talking about signs all over Pennsylvania. When you go into the rural area, you have the Pennsylvania Dutch um, have the eight pointed star as a hex design. And generally, they're supposed to be love and goodwill. And it's love, goodwill, again, protection, protection from lightning, protection from uh, windstorms and floods. And so, so basically, protecting the farm and its inhabitants, be them animal or be them people. Banish misfortune. Banish misfortune. Mis not yes. just a fun dance, but. So if you want to call them amulets, sure. I mean, if we want to use my definition or the definition. I, I think that would be an amulet then. Yeah, really. so pushing away bad luck. Yeah, and the um, the tulips I looked up briefly are supposed to be faith and trust in man. I, I know. Give somebody tulips. That, uh, that all sounds like the Victorian language of flowers. A little bit, because like the that. sheep's the sheep's of wheat. You know, yes. the little wheat oh, symbol yes. is is health and abundance, which you want in a farm. So. Here's actually a fun one. If you've ever gone into the much older cemeteries, and let's take cemeteries mm. that are probably the pioneer cemeteries of the 1800s or anything before 1920, and you will find them all over the country. But on a lot of these older headstones, or um, mausoleums or whatever are these symbols and these symbols all had meaning and these symbols also had an intent of say for a child it was a small baby lamb and it was also the hand of God so it was basically making sure that a uh, spirit at least for the people who buried them the spirit went to heaven yeah. and was protected by God so, again, you can see these everywhere. They're not something of the old past. You can see them modernly. Yeah, they do. There was, um, I, I, for instance, I remember because I go to Penzik every year mm -hmm. and I've toured out looking for things randomly through the countryside. And you see them occasionally. So I went and looked up, like, they have a rooster. Oh, it's actually not a rooster, apparently. It's a bird of paradise. <laughs> and so my my bad, beauty, wonder, mystery of life sort of thing. Um, there's double-headed eagles that are still out there from their old, both, I think, the Germanic roots, but... And Roman, the Germanic sure. Strength, courage, yes. strength and courage things, and and the stars. There was, always, like, the the star from a compass rose. Oh, yeah. Star. Yeah, the compass Yeah, that stars. was um, good luck and success and happiness. And, from, yeah. yeah. And some people would take a look at, say, the star. And I love stars because that's one of those things of if I can look up and I see the stars in the sky, yeah, all is right in the for, in the world with me or and for me. And so it's kind of a peaceful thing. Some people also say, oh, it's the star of Bethlehem. Okay, so if that works for you because yeah. that's where your main thoughts are, perfect. It's along the same lines. Well, I love it when I read books that actually somebody has taken the time to look a little something like that up. Yes. That when I say... Is that really? And then I go, oh, really? They did their work. And I somehow love that author a little bit more because they did that just a little bit of work to say, all right, what does this mean in this? Or, you know, the ones that use some kind of hieroglyphic and, yes. and actually look up and say, so what is the cat, the adder in a rowboat, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm inviting you to go for a nice boat ride with my chicken and snake here. And <laughs> yeah, I you know. Have lunch on a picnic somewhere. I don't know. No, it's, so it's it's the details of realism that build a world well for me, whether it's anchoring it in an existing world or making up a whole new one. It makes me sad when it's, it's a whole new world, but they haven't got it down to the, what does an individual character think of luck? Like, John, tell me about the cowboys in your story. Do they, do they I presume, would all carry something for luck, right? They're from multiple different cultures and thus have multiple different interpretations. They're um, 
to be complete. There would be a Grigri, there will be a number of rosaries for the Catholics and a little Saints medallion, St. Saint Christopher for a traveler. And uh, there's probably a, a couple tattoos that have significance, but I don't know how deep we'll get into it in that particular story. You know, and I was just thinking about that because she said cowboys, and I'm going, oh, yeah, cowboys, very superstitious <laughs> in a lot of cases. Think about pirates, that whole thing about the earring in the ear that was supposed to make you see better at night, and that was a, a presumed by some people or claimed by some hmm. people. It's like, okay, there's another. That's a talisman. Is if you think about it, an earring, ear? because it gives an attribute. Awesome. Um, I know. Right. But the earring in the ear was so you had gold, you wouldn't be lost, so they could pay for your burial when you washed it. Different, different people, different <laughs> cultures, oh, different thoughts. Oh, yeah. I, I enjoyed, we could get a little bit into the later the the later pirates of the Caribbean, if you will, mm. where they said get a lot of the Masonic symbols growing oh, in, yes, too. Yes. You know, that. Here's the, the skull and crossbones was actually a symbol of the Masons, which if anybody wants to read, you know, go through uh, uh, Manley's Secret Teachings of All Ages, you get all kinds of, oh, and this is the symbolism for all of these different areas and hubs of the Masons, the Sinclair family, deep into Scottish um, Scot Scottish Rite Masonry. So, yeah. There's, so, a, there's a lot of symbolism to recover. One of the reasons why certain things are in talismans charms is that for much of the middle ages most of your population was illiterate so the church taught symbolism as a way of reminding you of things that's why the windows that's why all the things carved in churches and why would that not go out into the community and why would that not be taken by an esoteric organization mm -hmm. well there are some ways of interpreting of saying that the entire bible is presented to you in a church in comic book form because you get the and we use the word cartoon when you're about to make a drawing or a painting, you start with a cartoon, which is the basic outline of it. So if all of Not those... Not just a cartoon form, but a religious symbolic one, the 12 stations of the cross. Exactly. And, These that are all done. Know, in, everybody can tell the story because once you tell the story to your child and you're pointing up to the windows as you go around, they get the story by pictures. Mm -hmm. So comic books exactly. are clearly sacred. Absolutely. I agree with this. Long live Stan Lee. Yes. I don't think that's in the greatest of taste myself, but anyway. <laughs> in all of these moments, one can look at the different ways in saying that in terms of pictorially lessons or talismans or doorbells, these are all ways that one can look. The last, you can look at all of these symbols and saying these were protections. Tattoos can be considered talismans on the skin. Heck, I mean, some people will go scars even if, if you want to go that far. The ones who do like the ritual scarification. Absolutely. And there are multiple cultures with that as a, oh, an attribute. Yes, yes. Also, just, uh, I mean, if nothing, if symbolism going, oh, this shows your rank in the tribe and this shows your bravery, or this actually, if you have these symbols, then you'll be coming back from the hunt successful, etc. Right. I really love the scholarship you bring to this, uh, Sandra. I love that you are opening up this world and and giving me the keys to research deeper. I just wanted to say that and thank you for bringing it. And now I say we're going to have to discuss symbology because we've cracked open the book a little bit and there's a lot. <laughs> oh, there is a ton. So much more for symbology, uh, which we will have to save for another episode as we have about reached the end of our allotted time. Can I, can I say one last thing? You bet. I hope everyone's enjoying a quarantine. And remembering that in the season of Lent, this 40 days, a quarantine from the Italian 40 days was how long the ship had to stay offshore to make sure it didn't bring you diseases. And the best thing about it is that the English first took it as the period af uh, after someone died where you couldn't kick their wife out of the house for 40 days because they were a widow, which shows you how ruthless they were back then, but also... Is one of those weird bits of history. So sometimes being in quarantine is a good thing. Well, I like the notion that they might be helping people pay their rent over these 40 days while they don't have a job. That is my best wish for anybody out there listening who is worried about themselves is that may your quarantine be successful and you find the aid that you need. 
We will put links to stories in the interesting that we've mentioned on our website, which is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can also find us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, if you have a question for Sandra, she loves to answer email, and we will connect you in that way. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid, Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Jackal Designs, enabling you all to go out and buy cool WDC swag. That would be awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. Mm-hmm.